Alright everyone, I've had a crazy end of summer, including going to Dragon Con, which was awesome, save for the part where I got a $100 Visa gift card digitally stolen. Very uncool. <laughs> so yeah, this video and the ideas for it have kind of been ruminating in the back of my mind for a long time. Longer than you might think. So I was pretty happy when it was pretty unanimously voted on for my last video of the summer. You see, as a kid, I never used to like sandcastles. To back it up a little further, I never even really liked going to the beach that much. I didn't like sand, I didn't like swimming in the ocean, I got stung by a jellyfish once, there was a lot of stuff, and while I loved being on the ocean itself, I never really wanted to go to the beach. The one thing I always found myself enjoying whenever we would go was digging in the sand. I loved digging holes in the sand, especially close to the water where the waves would occasionally bring water into the hole that I would then dig back out, but I never really wanted to build sandcastles. It's not that I couldn't or hadn't. We had a couple of buckets at the time at my grandparents' house that we would take and fill up with sand and a little water to pack it in, but every time we finished, I always thought it looked just like a bucket. A bucket that would always wash more and more away with time. I've never been very good with precision things, and especially not with sculpting, so they were never very elaborate, and when I tried it, it would always just kind of crumble. In fact, I always found kicking them or tearing them down to be much more fun than building them. I used to dig holes right outside the castle until chunks would start to fall off as the hole kept getting bigger and bigger until the entire castle was gone. But honestly, now I've kind of grown to miss them. There was something so simple and subtly fun about building them. Something that it's, it's kind of hard to find anymore. Anyway, I have to get this video out before fall, or at least at the beginning of it, otherwise this will be very tonally off. So strap in, because I'm talking about Moonrise Kingdom and building sandcastles. Step lively! 50 cents, jelly no beans. refunds. Popcorn's jelly. a quarter, jelly bean and root beer's two bits. Yes. Fall in, single bits, file. Here we go, here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. What is this, a peso? Uh, no sir, it's a bus token. Hmm. Bus token. Okay, back row. Stories mean a lot of different things to different people at different times. Stories are created from a personal idea brought to life through craft and care and research. And one thing that's always really fascinated me about storytelling is when the deep personal place the story comes from ends up hitting in such a once-in-a-lifetime moment where you feel like the film understands you completely, like it almost feels like it was a part of you when you watched it. For me, one of the first films I'd ever experienced this with was Wes Anderson's seventh feature film, Moonrise Kingdom. I hadn't seen too many other Wes Anderson movies at this point, in fact the only other two I'd watched were his stop motion movies, and while I thought one was a masterpiece and one was perfectly passable, there was never anything in particular that stood out to me on an emotional level with his films. I was almost more fascinated by his style and craft than really any emotion I got out of his movies. And I've seen Fantastic Mr. Fox nine times at this point, so you know it's freaking good. But that led me to be extremely curious to check out my first live-action movie from him. And what I ended up being handed was an anomaly of a movie that I both recognized was probably not as perfect as Fantastic Mr. Fox, but that was one of the first movies to truly almost have me in tears. So to really understand and talk about it in a way that I want to, we have to look at the movie itself. So. With how famously rigid and methodical his movies feel, what actually happens in Moonrise Kingdom? Because it's, uh, <laughs> complicated. The movie opens on a picture of a house inside of a house as thunder rolls, and we pan to see a child in the golden soak halls putting on a record as we move around to see the rest of our environment. The record he plays isn't normal music, but an educational tape teaching about different parts of an orchestra, taking specific note that to make a big piece of music, you have to have smaller sections playing together on the same theme. A girl walks in. She picks up her binoculars. She heads over to the window and picks up a book. The orchestra starts the theme. 
The girl opens the blinds and we cut perspective to outside the house through the same window as the music switches from being diegetic, playing over the record player, to playing crisply directly into our ears, as the girl looks through the binoculars at us. And we pan out to see the exact same house that was in the picture is the house she is currently in, and the title of our movie drops. A couple seconds more, and we hear thunder again, and our yellow title card flashes with it. We're a total of 2 minutes and 20 seconds into the movie, and holy crap, there's a lot to dissect here. Beyond keying us in immediately with the stiff panning camera and soft yellow color palette, and reality bending character movements that we have officially sat down for a Wes Anderson picture, we have our very first shot as a framing device for what the rest of the movie will be. Wes Anderson, when talking about the making of Moonrise Kingdom, said he had been interested in doing a story like this for a long time, and it describes it as sort of a fantasy or a dream of the characters, which I'll get more into later, but with the shot of the cross-stitched house combined with the shot as the music leaves from being part of the world to being sent directly at us, the movie almost instantly says we are in a weaved together world, a world that could only exist in, well, a story, which also ties into the record playing when it starts talking about different parts coming together to make a big piece, which can also also relate to the fact that at the end of the day, even though this movie is a romance movie, it's about family, poorly weaved together or not. Also, shout out to the lefty scissors. I forgot this was a Wes Anderson movie, and probably every frame is going to be this jam-packed with stuff. Oh yeah, and thunder rumbles, setting the tone of an ease as we look at the house, as the clock chimes, which, yeah. <laughs> There's one other super important thing introduced in this couple minute intro that I at least want to take a note of before we move on. Books. One of the last things we're introduced to before we go on is a stack of books that the girl is reading. Library books, to be specific. The kind of fantastical young reader books that I grew up on. The kind where the protagonist is almost always a kid, almost always on their own or with dead parents, and where they always go on high-stakes grand adventures with love interests and big casts of wide characters and dramatic set-piece finales. Which sounds vaguely familiar in plot. The picture we've just sat down to watch unfold is a storybook. Only in this case, what I would argue is the actual protagonist of the storybook isn't a girl, despite the fact that she states almost all the books she reads have female protagonists. But instead of her being the main protagonist of this story, it would be the young boy. He's got a similar story to her, but he's on his own. He's got adventure skills, and he offers her some kind of escape, just like getting pulled into a very good book. So, we've jumped through our framing device into our metaphorical book or orchestra or picture or whatever you really want to go with, and we cut back into the house, music still going, as the record goes on to talk about introducing the specific families of the orchestra, and you guessed it, we start panning through the house, looking at the other members of the girl's family. We cut around time and space as we see the family almost never interacts with each other save for the three young boys continuing to pass the girl looking through her binoculars in different places, and as we go time to time, we see that it's almost always raining, getting to the point where the boys even comment on it, something that will yet again change as the rest of the movie comes to play out. After this, we move outside. It's bright and sunny, without a hint of rain, as the girl goes to the mailbox with a rather appropriate title written on it, Summer's End, and pulls out the mail with a letter addressed to Susie Bishop of Summer's End. The girl is Susie Bishop. As she opens the letter, the music plays from the entire orchestra again and she looks directly at the camera, as she has, unawares to us at this point, just dragged the viewer into the inciting incident of a story we aren't even aware we're in yet. We go back to the record as it has taken off, and we've now officially entered the storybook. We go immediately into direct exposition narrative from a third-party figure of the story that is giving us information about the island and its geography and the fact that it's famous for a storm that will hit it in three days' time. Now, giving us the fact that this story, as we might have been clued into before, 
is truly a story with an ending. It is a clear, defined stakes and timer that will come. So now that the stakes are set and we've entered into Susie's essential fantasy, we go to our new location to introduce our new protagonist of the story. Kind of. Camp Ivano. As we follow, in a very Wes Anderson style, a troop leader of the Khaki Scouts. We quickly and comedically get introduced to a lot of the side characters and general care of Scoutmaster Ward as we find out that one of the scouts is missing from the breakfast table. Sam Shikusky is gone. Jiminy Cricket, he flew the coop. Cut location again and we are introduced to another one of the main players in this rather extensive orchestra, Captain Sharp, the island officer. He's being radioed by Ward that Sam has stolen some supplies from the camp and run away. Cut to note from Sam to Ward, very formally written, saying that he will no longer be a khaki scout and that the other scouts will be happy to hear this, and most important of all, it's not his fault. And as Captain Sharp tries to get in touch with Sam's family, we find out that Sam is just like all the storybook protagonists, an orphan. What? Like an orphanage? No, 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 not an orphanage. It would be more like an institution for young souls whose parents have sadly passed on. <laughs> Not only an orphan, but one that his foster parents believe to be disturbed and aren't planning on let coming back to their home even if they do find Sam, putting him in the hands of Captain Sharp and more directly, social services. As the troop starts to gather together for a rather unfriendly search party for Sam armed to the teeth, as they also believe him to be quote unquote disturbed and dangerous, and Ward and Sharp also go off by water and by car to search across the barely populated island, and Captain Sharp makes his way all the way over to Summer's End to talk to Susie's parents, who we saw in the opening. Still not a sign of rain in the sky. And the mom mysteriously rushes off to meet him by a lighthouse while Susie watches with her binoculars. They share a cigarette and seem very familiar with each other for having such a formal introduction, but minutes earlier, and after a first very unsuccessful day of searching, we finally make our way to our boy, Sam. He's paddling down the river with a rather extensive set of patches. He charts his way and covers his tracks and ends up in a familiar set of binoculars. Enter Susie and Sam on the most sun-soaked 16mm shot you've ever seen. We get close-ups of both of their faces as they're still a long way off from each other and their expressions are interesting. Now, in Wes Anderson films, people usually expect a certain amount of inhumanness, I think is a way I've heard it described. His camera movements are blocky, his sets are inhumanly immaculate, his dialogue is stilted, he has a very distinct style. Well, everyone knows Custer died at Little Bighorn. What this book presupposes is, maybe he didn't? But one thing I would definitely not say for his movies is that his characters are unexpressive. In fact, his almost characters of people that he uses allows his characters to be almost overexpressive in a way that can connect to a very precise line of worlds he builds. It doesn't feel real, but it feels emotionally real which is why every other person I know cries to Fantastic Mr. Fox. He takes the fantastical and makes it feel intimate by taking the characters and making them over the top. So what about these faces? Not familiar, not loving, but just sort of uneasy. We jump back in time one year earlier to the Island Church's production, Noah's Flood, a one-act British opera made to be performed by children, recounting the biblical Old Testament story of Noah's Ark and God's rebirth of the world based on the 15th century play style of Chester mystery plays, some of the first attempts to bring artistic nuance to recounting biblical stories and plays, focusing less on accuracy and more on the drama and emotions of the story, a play designed specifically to be performed in a church, not a theater. 
Sam is there watching with his troop and seeming completely uninterested. So instead, he gets up and leaves, going past the other children getting ready to go on, decked out in fantastical animal costumes two by two, looking for something, but seemingly nothing in particular. As he goes back into the girls' dressing room, and the bird girls are getting dressed, and he asks what kind of bird the girl in the middle is, seemingly not caring about any of the rest of them. Awkwardly and mysteriously, she answers, and they seem to connect over their displease with where they are in life. As he gets chased off by the theater director, after the performance, she gives him her address and asks for him to write. Over the next year, they had gotten close, talking over their specific, not great living situations, as Susie feels like her parents hate her and each other and has violent anger issues, and Sam nobody liking him as he's gone from orphanage to orphanage because he's kind of a little bit of a jerk, acting out on the fact that he's had almost no connection with anyone, ever. They don't feel like they have any other place to be in the world except with each other, like they're trapped on some kind of small island or something. Throughout the next little bit of the movie, Sam and Susie continue to get chased, Captain Sharp and Troopmaster Ward get chastised by everyone around them as we see more of our cast of island crew and Susie's parents being dysfunctional drunk cheating people. And despite a close run-in with the other troop members and several acts of violence including a stabbing and the dog getting shot, Susie and Sam make their way to mile 3.25 Tidal Inlet, a small beach area where no one ever goes that Sam found out about through his interest in cartography and geography their own promised land, away from everything and everyone else, as they awkwardly but sincerely stake claim to their new kingdom, doing things with no supervision, jumping in the water with all their clothes on, doing a practically nude painting, and piercing her ears with fish hooks. They're free to truly be together, and in so they talk about what they really want from life, and Susie says that she wants to be like the characters in her books, to go off in adventures, not get stuck in one place. And Sam simply responds, go on adventures too, not get stuck too. They truly have no idea what they're doing. Susie remarks as he talks about his foster parents, I always wished I was an orphan. Most of my favorite characters are. I think their lives are more special. To which Sam responds, I love you, but you don't know what you're talking about. And she responds, I love you too. Cut to one of the most iconic scenes from the movie, the dance on the beach. And there's a reason people remember it as well as they do. After all that's happened in the movie and all the threads that have been weaved, this is kind of the culminating moment truly of the film which is funny because it's only about halfway through. This is the moment when they are truly letting go and being free. They own the world, and everything is new and unusual, but it's theirs, and nothing will ever be the same. After they dance, they move in closer. They kiss. They feel everything so new, and they try to do what they think they should do with these new feelings, as they try to tongue kiss, even though they don't really know what that is and they feel each other's bodies for the first time in this deeply awkward, deeply sincere scene. And it feels like their kingdom is perfect, but could never last forever. Despite their lack of maturity and lack to even understand each other in any profound way, as Sam and Susie have both made light of each other's hardships because they're just kids. They're together in their own world and it's kind of beautiful in an awkward, misguided way. I call this the culmination of the story because despite the fact that a lot more happens in the movie and there's a more climactic ending, and I do mean a lot more because this movie is freaking dense, if you can't tell, I think this moment is when the movie hits exactly what Wes was going for and exactly what he wanted to make. As I said, Wes Anderson had been throwing around the idea for this about as long as he'd been crafting weird little stories about weird little casts of characters doing weird, funny, sincere things. 
of exploring the ideas of child romance and teen sexuality, that kind of overwhelming feeling that almost everyone goes through when everything to do with those feelings feels new and the world almost always feels like it's shrinking down on you, whether it's because of your parents or the lack of being able to relate to anyone with everything feeling new and hostile. But as you probably know, he's also been fascinated with young teen storybooks. Again, the kind of stuff I used to love reading at this age. And it's understanding of getting into the minds of kids and teens going through stuff like this. Giving them heroic, epic tales of danger and excitement and extremes to help them figure out who they are and who they're going to be as a person as they start to get more agency in their own lives. In an interview for Collider, when asked about the way the romance feels in the movie and if the storybook and dreamlike feel for everything was intentional, he said, yes it is. The memory of a fantasy is what somebody said to me at Cannes last week, and that's what it is. I remember this feeling from when I was that age and from when I was in fifth grade, but nothing really happened. I just experienced a period of dreaming about what might happen when I was that age. I feel like the movie could really be something that was envisioned by one of these characters. And that's kind of the key to the first half of this movie. That's what makes it feel so magical and special, and why this is the kind of culmination of the movie in my opinion. Or at least the perfect build into what the movie is trying to say by the end. This is kind of a picture-perfect teen romance moment, even if they don't really know what to do with it. They're together outside of anything, any adults or rules, and then reality comes flooding back in. <laughs> Nothing lasts forever. Especially not sandcastles. They're literally made out of material and in an environment that will one day be washed away. So why do we build them? What is it that has made them a staple of going to the beach, even if it was something I never really liked doing when I did? Well, in my experience, it usually isn't to make a great artistic masterpiece. If you've seen some of mine, you know what I mean. But it's to build something together with the people around you. To quickly stake your claim while you can, to say that even if not forever, we were here, and it was fun. At the beginning of the movie, as I said, we clearly set up that the storm will come, and that this is a story, but it's also reality for Susie, and despite the fact that she has her binoculars as she describes as her magic powers, she can't always be looking through them. And just as fast as they got to their kingdom and called it theirs, everything comes crashing down on them. More specifically, the entire island that was looking for them comes crashing down on them. <laughs> they get dragged apart by the adults and told they will pretty much never see each other again. They're getting sent back to the lives that they tried so hard to escape, and this time even worse than before. Sam doesn't have a home, and Susie's parents are furious. And, and as the weather starts to pick up, barely noticeable in the background of the film, the two protagonists sit in their own little prisons, and Sam talks with Captain Sharp about how he envies his life despite the lonely, empty feelings we've been shown that he has in it. Again, these kids have no real idea what life is like. But the other troop members of Sam's troop, after seeing why he did what he did, and what will happen to him, once his foster family won't take him back, plus the fact that that one jerk was KO'd with lefty scissors, they want to give him one last stupid chance to get away together. They break them both out and head off island to the nearby Fort Lebanon of the Khaki Scouts, as they know someone who might help them run away together. The storm is kicking up even more as they cross the water and sneak their way to a rather interesting character who not only agrees to help these two teens run away possibly into child labor on a fishing vessel, but also agrees to not legally marry them. But again, it's the ritual that's important. I can't offer you a legally binding union. It won't hold up in the state, the county, or frankly any courtroom in the world due to your age, lack of a license, and failure to get parental consent. But the ritual 
does carry a very important moral weight within yourselves. This man, of course, is played by Jason Schwartzman. In the latter half of this movie, things start to not only fall in on the two kids, but the fantastical elements of the story that feel more book-like start to get more and more extreme in their absurdity. Like the very fabric of their reality is folding in on itself when they hit their perfect moment and it didn't land. Like the moment a little bit after when they end up getting found again after having to go back for Susie's binoculars and running into Lefty Scissors Boy again, and are running in this almost silent movie comedy-esque scene, Sam stops, and in an epic storybook fashion, he says he will run no more, and is quickly struck by lightning, and is perfectly fine. Shout out to Patterson for real for bringing this couple back and saying that they are fake, mythical forces. I love that for them, because that's the only way they could survive stuff like this. The skies start opening up more and more as they run off and hide in the church from earlier in the movie, but it starts raining a lot, so much that it breaks the dam and flooding is on the way. The prophesized storm is here. Everyone who is on the other island, which at this point is pretty much all our main players who are again chasing the kids, this time joined by social services played by Tilda Swinton, upping the stakes of being found even more, to the point that Captain Sharp almost doesn't want them to be found because he knows that after this, Sam will truly never have the chance to have a home again and might be subjected to terrible psychological therapy because it was the 60s and the stakes have to be taken to the absolute extreme. They find the kids again, this time hiding in the balcony of the church, wearing the animal costumes from the play from before. And as they run out onto the roof, they're trying as hard as they can to keep running away from everything. They find that they really have nothing left. Nowhere to go. No more friends or family to help. Nothing but the flood below. And as their animal costumes get washed away by the rain, they decide that they're going to try to jump to safety, even though that's ridiculous and there's about five inches of water below. They can't go on without each other. But as they're about to do it, Captain Sharp has worked his way up and convinced them to stop, claiming that he'll adopt Sam with the help of Susie's lawyer parents, and they could at least be on the same island together. And as they just seem to be coming back, lightning strikes again breaking the tower they're all on, as Sharp jumps off the side, being hooked onto a rope, and grabs them. I think this is one of the most important shots of the movie. Throughout, we've had this beautiful, yellow, sun-filled, 16mm gorgeous film adding a layer of fantasy to the film, along with the almost storybook illustration cinematography, where almost any frame of the film could be paused and animated into a book illustration. And now, at this final climax, we have a shot that literally looks straight out of a book, as their bodies magically are all being held up, hanging off the broken tower in silhouettes. It's the end of the grand fantasy, but not quite the end of the story. Despite everything playing into this being a dream or a fantasy of the kids of the movie, it operates in movie as also being reality for the most part. There is no wake-up moment for Susie as she's realized she's fallen asleep while reading a good book. Their collective combination of reality and imagination is the reality of the film. And after the epic conclusion of the storybook she was making in her head, things come back down to simplicity. Things aren't magically all better, but they've at least started to be. The inlet that they had as their kingdom was completely wiped out during the storm. Sam as someone who actually cares for him and understands him as a father figure, and Susie has somewhat worked out and accepted that her parents aren't and won't ever be perfect people, but at least they're there for her, and Sam can see her sometimes and hang out, and it's nice, and as Susie puts down her binoculars for the last time, we can see the last painting Sam does in the film. It's the kingdom that they shared together. For however briefly it was, for however fake and unrealistic it was, and can now last forever. As we fade to look at it one more time, as it was when they were there. Roll credits. Whew. That's a lot to get through. If you can't tell, 
this is a complicated freaking movie, and I love it for that. There is clearly so much detail and care and ideas packed into this movie on a level that I would be hard pressed to talk about in one video if I wasn't going to go on and an hour long rabbit hole for each individual detail and reference and thematic meaning and line, but that's not really what I do on this channel, and quite frankly, I don't have the time. What I do try and do with this channel is talk about why something means something to me, to try and relate a piece of art to something in my life. And this one took a lot of thinking because it had affected me deeply when I first watched it and I thought it was for a pretty straightforward reason. I was young and in love for the first time when I watched it, so the young and in love exploration of sexuality and romance and the difference in truly trying to get to know each other on a romantic level that young stood out to me. But as I've gotten older and older and things don't seem so new and unstable with my relationship specifically, the movie has continued to enthrall me and deeply affect me every watch. But why? What is the movie actually at the end of the day trying to say? beyond its insane detail and elements that I haven't even been able to get into that much, like the mind-bending structure and pacing and the amazing performances and great comedy and beautiful sets and locations and costumes and everything that's in this movie. It's truly a technical masterpiece, even though I know you can say that for a lot of Wes's movies. But there's something there with this one, that despite it honestly not being the funniest or the most exciting, even compared to what I think is his worst movie so far, has stuck with me, where I'm almost mesmerized by it every time it get dragged into its immersive, anxiety-inducing world. There are a lot of different takes on what this movie is actually trying to say by the end, or what its many layers and metaphors and threads are trying to lead to the picture it's actually trying to paint or leave you with. And several people I know are disappointed by the end, and the story's conclusion as it just kind of fizzles out with no real consequences for the children after all they did. No real romantic hurrah, no real solid resolution of the relationships with their families. It's all so messy. Is it about finding your sexuality? Are the ears getting pierced a metaphor for losing your virginity? Is it all about the inevitability of getting trapped in a life with an unhappy family if you don't take the opportunity to chase after your dreams and choose your own family? Is it about parenthood and the way adults affect the lives of kids they're put in positions of power and responsibility over? Is it about fantasy stories and books as I didn't even get that into? Because storybooks are, get so much attention in this movie she steals them from the library, which has thematic relevance. She reads them throughout the movie in different passages. The storybooks were so important to this movie that Wes almost had different animated segments for each story, but he didn't feel like they fit in the movie, so instead he made them anyway and had them be a promotional short film for the movie. But I digress. And, well, on a technical level, yes, to pretty much... All of those, those are clear and straightforward readings to pull from the film, and almost all of them are given equal importance and time to breathe in the film, which again is a crazy feat, especially for how short this movie is. But there's one scene that ends up being one of the most important to stick with me on what the themes overall of the movie is trying to go for. The Noah's Flood scene at the beginning of the movie, and the actual flood at the end of the movie in the same church. A clear parallel set up as all these things that we've explored the whole movie get washed away in the insane prophesized storm. In the biblical story of Noah's Ark, the world has become a truly evil place full of one thing that God despised more than anything, murder. And he's about to wipe out the whole world, but he finds that there is still some love in the world through Noah and his family. So they plan essentially to do a good old-fashioned factory reset on the world, save for Noah and his family, so the human race can still go on, and also most of the animals. R.I.P. to the dinosaurs, who I'm sure were being exploited for terrible things, you will always be missed. So for 40 days and 40 nights, the earth is flooded, the skies open up, and water from above and below and volcanoes rain like it literally has never rained before. 
I know it really isn't the time, but I'm a Christian who loves science, so I think this is really cool as heck, as this was probably the moment that triggered the great atmospheric shift that led to most of the major evolution, especially in, in insects that we find today. After the flood and the much longer than 40 days they spent on the ark waiting for the water levels to go down, all the family hopped out onto land. God was like, dang, I don't ever want to do that again, that was horrifying, and gave us the old rainbow to show that they wouldn't give up on humanity again. This story and the fact that they're performing not only it, but again an extravagant version of it that plays up its themes really comes down to me on what the message of the entire film is trying to go for. Like what I grabbed from the biblical story in an abstract sense is to not give up on humanity, both from a Noah and God perspective. So when you take this story, the story of darkness and death and hopelessness, leading to not inherently a happy ending, but a world of change forever for not only the people involved, but the entire world around them. And we look at the scene in the church when it comes down to it. Susie and Sam together on the tower, ready to jump, to throw everything away for each other, but not even for each other. As I've talked about, this isn't a normal love story. They're young, and they love each other because... They feel like they found someone who gets them and will let them just be them, even though, as they've shown, they don't even have the maturity level to really connect on a deep level. So what the relationship itself comes down to is that dance on the beach. It's an escape from all fears, even when there's a sense of uneasiness for the future, even if they might not survive the fall, because this way... They can still be kids. They're ready to essentially risk throwing away their lives just to chase that peace. Even when their entire miserable, unloved world is washing away, they haven't given up on the one bit of love and humanity they have left. Each other, no matter how uncertain it is. That moment of the ground being their own. But as they fall to their deaths, they're caught. Not by a picture-perfect man showing how clear their future will be, but by an imperfect man who spent the whole film just trying to help Sam and be there for them. Even in the biggest storm of their lives, when everyone in the world who is trying to crush their dreams. So to put it somewhat more simply than that, the movie to me is all about anxiety. Especially anxiety of the harsh world around you and the few things you know changing, the anxiety and mental health of getting older, the anxiety of falling in love for the first time, the anxiety of not knowing what you're doing or if what you're standing on will be there tomorrow. And its answer isn't anything extravagant. It's not some storybook ending this time. The conclusion and answer to that overwhelming feeling of hopelessness plaguing our protagonists the entire film is just... Even when the situation is out of your control, and not what you want it to be, you can pick who your friends and family are. You can choose to look at things through those binoculars, even for a brief moment. People always ended up helping them as they needed it. They never left each other. They never even left her binoculars. As you grow into your own people, you can also take time to still be the thing that you've always loved. You don't have to lose yourself as a child, even if your childhood was washed away and your innocence was lost. You can still enjoy building sandcastles before the tide comes in. And that's why it touched me so much when I first watched it, when I was falling in love for the first time and everything was changing, and that's why it still means so much to me, even more so than Fantastic Mr. Fox. It's something that so far in my life has always been true. I'm still young. Things are still changing all the time, but my life has been beautiful, and each moment while it lasts can be a whole kingdom to my own, with the people and the art and the places I love most in it, even if it doesn't last. Especially if I take time to look for the good and find the people who mean the most to me. So, yeah, I'm misbuilding sandcastles now, and would love to do it sometime with my family and my girlfriend. I hope you had a good summer, everyone, and I can't wait for fall.
Whew, a little bit of a stressful one to get through. I apologize if the production isn't quite up to the normal quality. Again, I am switching setups entirely, which just added to the stress of making this video so late because I had such a busy August. So I'm working in a new editing software on a new computer, and it's just a lot. But uh, thank you guys for watching. It means so much to me that you guys have stuck with the channels for so long. We're rising in subscribers still, and I, I don't know, you guys are just the best. It's been stressful, stressful times, but we're moving towards fall, which is amazing. I love fall. I've got a really exciting video planned for October, so probably no poll for what my next video is going to be this time, just because I've had this planned for a while at this point. Uh, but I love you all. I hope you had a good summer. That was cool. That was a thing that happened, and I will catch you guys next month hopefully with a little bit better editing. Who knows? Maybe this video will be pristine. Maybe this will be my best edited video yet. Anyway, bye.